Okay, this is chapter three, Control Volume Analysis, part seven. This is an introduction to the Bernoulli equation. In this video, I'll start by deriving the famous Bernoulli equation. The Bernoulli equation is named after Daniel Bernoulli, an 18th century Swiss mathematician and physicist. As you'll see in subsequent lectures, Bernoulli's equation is a powerful mathematical tool for modeling steady incompressible flows. Later in the course, we'll use the Bernoulli equation in various ways to measure flow rates in pipes. Bernoulli's equation can also be used to explain how airplane wings get their lift. But Bernoulli's equation does have some limitations, which I'll discuss at the end of the presentation. Then in the next video, which I'll link to at the end of this video, I'll do a very simple numerical example of using Bernoulli's equation to predict the discharge flow rate from an open tank. And then in later videos, we'll extend the Bernoulli equation to more complex problems. There are a few ways to derive Bernoulli's equation. Here I'm going to use an energy balance approach on a section of fluid. In this diagram, I've shown a one-dimensional flow in a tapered pipe or flow in what is called a stream tube, the three-dimensional equivalent of a streamline. The flow is from left to right, so from one to two. The flow enters here at point one with cross-sectional area A1, velocity V1, pressure P1, and at some elevation relative to a reference of Z1. The flow gains elevation and exits at station two with a different velocity, pressure, and elevation. The assumptions in Bernoulli's equation are steady one-dimensional flow. So the velocity across the pipe or stream tube is constant at any point. Also, the flow is considered to be incompressible. So the density is constant, even though the pressure changes throughout the flow. Also, Bernoulli's equation approximates the flow as frictionless, so the flow is assumed to have no viscosity. In fluid dynamics, this is called an inviscid flow. Recall that viscosity is like fluid friction, so this assumption is equivalent to saying that there are no energy losses as the flow goes from 1 to 2. Of course, all real fluids have viscosity, so Bernoulli's equation is restricted to those regions of the flow uh, that are nearly frictionless. I'll talk more about that assumption uh, later in this presentation, so I'll discuss the practical limitations after the derivation. So what we're considering here in this derivation is basically steady one-dimensional flow in a pipe. From continuity, which is conservation of mass, we have that the mass flow rate, m dot, is constant throughout the pipe. At any cross section, we have the same mass flow rate. m dot equals rho VA. And as we discussed, the flow is incompressible, so rho is constant, so the volume flow rate is also constant. The volume flow rate is constant at all cross sections in the pipe. Using the first law of thermodynamics, which is conservation of energy for the control volume, we can write this expression. The rate of work done by the pressure forces at the inlet and outlet equals the rate of change of kinetic energy from the inlet to the outlet. So that's 1 half mv squared at the outlet minus 1 half mv squared at the inlet plus the rate of change of gravitational potential energy from the outlet to the inlet. So m dot gz2 minus m dot gz1. Recall that the flow is being approximated as frictionless. The flow has no viscosity. It's inviscid. So that means there's no shear stress on the wall. So the energy is conserved from 1 to 2. So equation one is just simple energy accounting. The rate of energy flow into the control volume equals the rate of energy flow out. Oh, and there's one other thing I wanted to highlight, that this equation is a rate of energy flow, so we're using m dot, not m. So each term has the units of joules per seconds or watts. Here I've rewritten the energy balance equation one from the previous slide. 
Now we consider the flow moving a small distance in time increment delta t. In time increment delta t, the flow at the inlet moves a distance delta x1, and at the outlet it moves a distance delta x2. There is a pressure force at the inlet and outlet. This pressure force does work on the control volume. So now we need to evaluate the external work done by those pressure forces at the inlet and outlet. Recall that work is force acting through a distance, so F times delta X. And in a fluid flow, the force is the pressure times the cross-sectional area. So our work is the pressure times the cross-sectional area times the displacement. But in this case, we have a flowing fluid. So it's not the work that we're after, it's the rate of work. It's work dot that we want. So that's the force times distance per unit time. Distance per unit time is velocity. So our rate of work is the pressure force times uh, the local velocity, which is pressure times area times the local velocity. We can further simplify this, noting that the cross-sectional area times the local velocity is the volume flow rate, which is a constant. So the rate of work done by the pressure force is just the local pressure times the volume flow rate. Now we can express the rate of work done by the external pressure forces at one and two. The rate of work done by the external pressure forces is just the pressure at one times the flow rate minus the pressure at two times the volume flow rate. Note that the first term is positive because the pressure force and the displacement are in the same direction. So that's work done on the control volume. Whereas the second term here is negative because at the exit, the pressure force and the displacement are in opposite directions. So the pressure force at the outlet is actually removing energy from the control volume. Now we can substitute our external work in terms of the pressure forces and the flow rate back into equation one, and we get this expression. Again, recall that we're just equating the rate of work done by the pressure forces at the inlet and the outlet to the change in kinetic energy and the change in potential energy of the flow. So here again, I've written the energy balance at the top of the next slide, noting that the mass flow rate is rho VA and velocity times cross-sectional area is our flow rate. We can get that m dot equals rho Q. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the substitution for rho Q in for m dot in this equation in the four locations. And this is what I've done here. I've just made that simple substitution for rho Q for m dot. Now we can notice that every term in this equation has a Q, has the volume flow rate. So we can cancel the volume flow rate. And so next what I've done is I've divided by density and I've done some rearranging. You'll notice, and you can check my algebra here, I've put all the terms involving the inlet conditions on the left-hand side and all of the terms involving the outlet conditions at 2 on the right-hand side. And this is the final result. This is the famous Bernoulli equation. We're going to use this equation widely in the remainder of chapter three. As you saw from the derivation, Bernoulli's equation can be interpreted as an energy balance along a streamline. Here I've rewritten Bernoulli's equation. Remember that this is an idealized frictionless flow, so there's no energy loss caused by viscous effects. Viscosity is like friction that burns up energy in the flow, but we're neglecting that effect. So the total energy in the flow remains constant. There are three types of energy in the flow at a given point. The first is kinetic energy. Now recall that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. There's no m here, so this is kinetic energy per unit mass of the flow. The second term is usually called flow work or pressure work. It's the energy associated with pressure per unit mass. And the last term here is the potential energy term. Remember that potential energy is the weight force through a height. 
So this is the potential energy per unit mass of the flow. When you add up these three terms, you get the total energy per unit mass at point one at the inlet. And recall that there's no energy being dissipated by viscosity. It's a frictionless flow. So that equals the total energy at two on the right hand side, which equals a constant for the flow. This means that if the flow speeds up and the kinetic energy increases, that must have come at the expense of either flow work or potential energy. The pressure must have decreased or the elevation of the flow must have gone down. We'll talk about this more in subsequent examples. Next, I'd like to introduce you to a common term in fluid mechanics, the concept of head. If we divide the Bernoulli equation by G, we get this form of the Bernoulli equation. In this form, you'll see that the potential energy term here, because we divided by G, is just Z. It has units of meters. And recall from chapter one, the principle of dimensional homogeneity, that all the terms in this equation have the same units. So in this form, all the terms in the Bernoulli equation have units of distance. And in fluid mechanics, that's called head. That's why this slide is entitled the fluid mechanics definition of head. Now the full units of head can be written as Newton meters per Newton. So you can see the Newtons cancel and you just end up with meters. So head can be thought of as the energy, Newton meters is a joule per unit weight of fluid. Now each of the terms in Bernoulli's equation in this form have a special name. The kinetic energy term is called velocity head. The pressure term is called pressure head. And Z, of course, which is just a distance, is called elevation head, or just simply head. As I'll show you in the next slide, it's important to get familiar with this terminology because it's widely used in the fluid mechanics industry. For example, if you go to purchase a pump, the manufacturer will assume that you know what head is. As an example, I googled some pump specs and I came up with this company, Liberty Pumps. They make submersible pumps and here's three different models of submersible pumps, a one third horsepower, a half horsepower and a three quarter horsepower pump. If you buy one of these pumps, you will get the specification chart that I've shown over here on the right. On the vertical axis here, we have the total head in feet on this side and the total head in meters on this side. On the horizontal axis, we have the pump discharge rate in gallons per minute. So that's the pump flow rate. On the bottom, it's in gallons per minute and the top it's in liters per minute. So what this chart is telling you is that if you had a short horizontal pipe, so horizontal, so no elevation change, you'd get a pump discharge rate with the one third horsepower pump, you get a discharge rate of about 50 gallons per minute. But if the pipe changed elevation and went to higher and higher elevations, you'd get less and less flow. And in fact, what happens is at about 22 and a half feet, you don't get any flow at all. The flow rate goes to zero. As you pump to higher and higher elevations, you get less and less flow because the pump is having to put the energy of the pump into raising the fluid. So that's typically how pump specs work. We'll talk more about pumps later in the course. This is just a brief introduction to the concept of head in fluid mechanics. Okay, I promised I'd talk about the practical limitations of Bernoulli's equation. We're going to use this equation a lot in this course and it can be easily misused. So I thought I should spend a bit of time on this. The first requirement is that you have to have steady flow. And most of the flows we're going to consider in this course will be steady. It can also be applied for flows that are changing slowly. And in fact, the example I'm going to do in the next video is a situation where the flow is not really steady, but it's changing very slowly and we can approximate the flow as steady. As you saw in the derivation, we assumed that the flow was incompressible. So Bernoulli's equation is good for liquids, but it has to be used with some caution for gas flows where compressibility affects 
could be significant. Now recall from chapter one, this rule of thumb that the Mach number is less than 0.3 for small compressibility effects, where the Mach number is the ratio of the speed of the fluid to the speed of sound in the fluid. For air near room temperature, that corresponds to a velocity less than about 100 meters per second or about 360 kilometers per hour, which is pretty high. So you can use Bernoulli's equation to analyze the flow in ducts and even the flow over the wing of a low speed aircraft, but you can't apply Bernoulli's equation to high speed flows. You also saw in the derivation that we assumed that uh, the flow is frictionless. We derived Bernoulli's equation neglecting viscous shear stresses. So you can't apply Bernoulli's equation where viscous effects dominate. And right at the solid wall, viscosity causes the fluid to come to a complete halt. Recall from chapter one that this is called the no-slip condition. So you certainly can't apply Bernoulli's equation at the wall. For the same reason, you can't apply Bernoulli's equation in regions of intense mixing, where you have lots of energy loss because of flow turbulence. So if you throttle flow across a valve, and by throttling I mean you drop the pressure by partially closing the valve, you won't be able to apply Bernoulli's equation across the valve, as I've shown here. That's because the energy in the flow is not a constant. There'll be energy losses associated with the valve. As you saw in the derivation, Bernoulli's equation applies to flow along a streamline, and you'll see that when I do numerical examples, I always draw a streamline to remind myself of that limitation. In addition, you saw in the derivation that the total energy in the flow at 1 equals the total energy in the flow at 2. So you can't be adding or taking away energy from the flow between 1 and 2. So the last restriction is that you can't have a pump or a turbine between the two points on the streamline. In other words, you can't have the addition or extraction of work since the energy has to be constant along a streamline. Later in this chapter, we'll relax this assumption. We'll modify Bernoulli's equation. It becomes what's called the general energy equation. I'll show you how to analyze systems with pumps and turbines and losses due to valves, which is what practical engineering systems usually involve. But for now, when you're using Bernoulli's equation, the energy of the flow must be a constant. This is a figure taken from your textbook, figure 3.13 out of White and Zoo. It illustrates some of the limitations on the use of Bernoulli's equation, and it makes some of the points that I've already discussed. On the left, they're showing a jet aircraft in a wind tunnel, and what they're saying is that you can apply Bernoulli's equation away from the wall, but very close to the surface of the wind tunnel or the aircraft, uh, viscosity dominates, and you have the no-slip condition, so you can't apply Bernoulli's equation very close to these solid surfaces. In the second sketch over here, the point being made is that you cannot apply Bernoulli's equation from 1 to 2, as I've shown here. If you were analyzing a streamline from 1 to 2, you've got work addition by this fan. As we previously discussed, the energy content of the flow has to be a constant along the streamline. You can apply Bernoulli's equation before the fan and after the fan, but you can't apply Bernoulli's equation across the fan because you've got work input. So now you know something about the limitations of Bernoulli's equation. And that completes this presentation. In the next video, I'm going to do this simple numerical example. In this example, we use Bernoulli's equation to calculate the flow rate from an open tank. The link to this next video should pop up in a second or two.